so today, today's talk, um, initially the, the, the idea for this, uh, for this talk was, uh, was based on a forthcoming paper uh, which, we, which I'm writing, uh, well, almost, we almost finished uh, with a co-author, um, uh, Ahmed Mehdi, uh, he's, uh, he w used to work for Interfax Energy and then worked for IISS and now working for, for, for NATO Energy. Uh, uh, doing energy research there. Uh, so the, uh, obviously now it's quite difficult to say when you say to people second oil privatization, the people say what privatization? Uh, particularly taking into account the recent uh, uh, sort of, not agreements, but initial agreements to, uh, uh, you know, the takeover, uh, Rosneft takeover over TNK BP and the BP buying equity. Uh, when I ask uh, uh, one of Russian, because during Valda meeting, we all, everything was done on the Chatham House floor, so one of the ministers uh, um, who was uh, um, basically promoting the idea of privatization and was quite against uh, uh, Rosneft taking over TNKBP, he actually said, well, it, it's actually privatization, we, uh, because BP is buying uh, a large stake in TNKBP, and because of that, uh, it is actually privatization. But I personally think that um, it's the, the problem in Russia is always been the case of the two, gra two groups, the pro-state and pro-private groups. Some people call them conservatives, some people call them uh, you know, liberals. Um, but it's, 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 often, it's often difficult to, uh, to really define because those camps are not homogeneous. They're, they're quite, uh, quite diverse. Uh, also in terms of their, their, their outlook. Um, at the moment, the way it looks is that the Russian oil privatization uh, will take place. The government wants to push and go ahead with this and uh, privatize Rosneft completely by 2016, by the end of 2016, with uh, the government retaining golden share. But um, I have serious doubts personally that this will actually happen. I think that this um, uh, Rosneft will, will remain uh, a type of global NOC, national oil company. And I will explain that uh, some of the problems that uh, the Russian oil industry is, is, is facing at the moment perhaps can only be resolved uh, with this type of company, a global NOC, particularly if you, if you uh, I mean, you all know that uh, the majority of uh, hydrocarbon resources in the world are controlled by national governments either directly or through their national oil companies. And when it comes to challenges that the Russian oil industry is facing, um, uh, you know, I think a number of experts think that it's quite questionable whether private companies, vert private Russian vertically integrated oil companies can, only, can actually deal with those problems. And also, uh, um, so the idea now is that we'll see partnerships between Rosneft as a sort of Russian global NOC, together with international oil companies, developing new challenging resources uh, in East Siberia and the Arctic. But at the same time, something which has always been neglected in Russia is that the role of small and medium enterprises. Uh, and this, this idea of promoting small and medium enterprises uh, um, is not new. Uh, the, the government experts and energy experts, uh, independent experts, have been talking about this for many years, and there was even a letter uh, sent to Igor Sechin uh, in 2010, as far as I remember, by a number of Russian experts, uh, urging him to focus on the development on, or creating um, institutional uh, incentives for small and medium companies to help with the development of, of um, uh, of uh, hydrocarbon resources. Why I'm starting with small and medium companies because uh, the problem with, uh, with the Russian oil sector is, uh, is the, uh, the resource basis, as, as you know, uh, uh, is about to start declining quite rapidly uh, because over the past 20 years, uh, the development of the Russian oil industry has been based on Soviet inheritance. Uh, geological achievements, infrastructure, uh, the industrial sort of uh, infrastructure around, around the fields, the, the export infrastructure. The only achievement, I think, of the, of the, of the post-Soviet uh, post period is the, the, the construction of uh, uh, 
East Siberia Pacific Ocean Pipeline, which was actually built on Chinese, Chinese money anyway. So uh, in that respect, the, 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 uh, the fact is that what we had in, 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 um, in the 90s, we had a debate uh, within the government uh, just before the oil industry uh, was privatized, is how that privatization should be done. So the first, the first wave of Russian oil privatization, uh, initially it was all about how to, how to um, boost production because the, there was a, a massive production decline uh, because of the disintegration of links uh, and also some, some serious uh, issues uh, with the management of the oil industry uh, in the late 80s, early 90s. And um, so the idea was, uh, at least the initial idea of, of the president in, in, uh, the, with the decree of uh, November 92 um, was, you know, we, we would partially privatize the oil industry, the government will retain uh, a prominent role. And uh, Igor Shafranik, who was energy minister at the time, argued that uh, we, need, we need a national oil company which will have the remaining, uh, which will have the 51% control over the oil uh, oil industry, and um, and uh, the, the the decree in the, in the, for example uh, in April '95, uh, one of the ideas was to facilitate the creation of of, uh, of or enhancing the role of Rosneft uh, in the oil sector, and um, however the the what what. Uh, I would call it the more conservative, more pro-state approach uh, was, was uh, promoting. Uh, Yeltsin actually didn't settle for that, as you can see on this slide. Um, uh, Rosneft really wanted to operate like, a, like a, or at least Shafranik saw it as more, more as a sort of uh, type of energy, energy ministry type uh, organization, which will be based on Statoil, uh, you know, uh, a national oil company, a Norwegian national oil company, and it will manage uh, the oil industry. As you know as well, in Norway they have no oligarchs uh, in the oil sector, they have no big private, uh, private oil companies, so it's all mainly states, uh, you know, state managed um, uh, by a partially, partially, pr partially privatized uh, um, national oil company. However, because there was a, a quite a big uh, uh, disagreement between, between the liberals and conservatives, uh, Yeltsin uh, tried to find some, some kind of status quo and he he basically uh, uh, did create uh, Rosneft, but uh, uh, at the same time, uh, he was not going to promote uh, uh, complete privatization or, or uh, more large-scale privatization. He was also, uh, at the time, was more interested in, in uh, uh, basically uh, partial privatization of the oil industry. But what happened in... Uh, Towards the mid of, of this, because if you look at this decree, which was passed in uh, 1st of April, and on the first column you can see this is this is sort of uh, a Shafranik's proposal and and the actual the outcome. Um, the but what happened is that towards the mid 90s, with the rise of the communist movement in Russia and uh, the also the um, serious uh, problems with regional elites in Russia which acted as a, as a sort of county elite in many ways in, in the relations with the federal government. Uh, and because there was uh, basically no, no civil society, uh, the, the, uh, the political institutions were weak, uh, political parties were, you know, again, uh, not really playing a very prominent role. So the idea for uh, Yeltsin was that the only way he can create some kind of a new institutional base, political institutional base, was to create um, new owners, uh, the oligarchy groups, and uh, this is one of the reasons why, uh, uh, towards the end, uh, towards the end of, of his uh, first term in office, he settled for this uh, uh, loans for shares auctions, uh, where most of the most of the people who were participated in those in those auctions were pre-selected by the government on the basis of their political loyalty, um, and. Uh, at the same time, uh, another interesting thing which happened is that uh, Shafranik, of course, resigned uh, in protest. He said, I don't think it's a good idea just to, to allow vertically integrated oil companies to manage the industry because they will not be very good at managing the industry. And um, so what happened is that the, 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 uh, the sort of the, the more, the more pro-private pro argument at the time won uh, its day. And uh, by... Um, uh, 
you know, by, 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 the, by the sort of, uh, between 96, if you look, you know, the period 96, 97, uh, 98, there was privatization, and Rosneft lost uh, a number of its assets, which were uh, used to create uh, uh, also a private company, Sibneft, uh, controlled by uh, Boris Yeltsin's uh, confidant, uh, uh, Roman Abramovich. And um, so, but what happened is that, uh, in a way, the, the sort of the pro-private argument lost its course uh, in the early 2000s, uh, simply because of the transfer pricing, simply because uh, Belgian integrated oil companies were not really investing enough, and there was there was a quite a big difference between uh, oil companies which were owned by uh, the banking sort of uh, community or the, the so-called financiers, uh, such as uh, Sibneft, such as uh, Yukos, which was uh, controlled by Manatep, and such as. Uh, uh, TNK, uh, which was controlled by uh, by uh, the consortium of uh, uh, Alpha, Access, and, and Renova. At the time, it was uh, just Alpha, Alpha, and, and Renova. So, um, uh, the, the, and also there was so on one hand there were those guys, and on the other hand there were traditional oil men, uh, such as uh, uh, Vladimir Bogdanchikov of Surgut Neftigaz, you know, Vagit Alekperov. The approach to the oil production was quite different because the financiers. Always, often been, been accused by oil men that uh, all they're interested in is just uh, extracting easy oil, uh, applying uh, sort of new technologies just to, to uh, boost production, boost capitalization of companies. Because the idea of those guys was to uh, 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 we need to boost capitalization in order to sell the company to a foreign investor. And uh, this is uh, this is exactly what happened with with uh, uh, with. Uh, um, uh, Yukos, uh, when it was offered to, to uh, Exxon Mobil and to Conoco Phillips when they had negotiations, uh, and also the idea was that uh, Yukos and Sibnia would be merged together, and then uh, would be uh, sold uh, to to a foreign a foreign company, uh, and also TNK, as you know, uh, they built an alliance with BP and uh, created this uh, this uh, company uh, TNK BP. Uh, as you know, the, the, the Yukos affair took place, and uh, that deal never, never, never surfaced. And um, but one problem of the of the of the Yukos period, uh, so of, often this is mis misinterpreted, I think, uh, not only in literature or in, in the media, uh, but also in the expert community, is uh, there are different reasons for the demise of Khodorkovsky. But the the the, the main argument, for example. Uh, in, in, in my book and, and, and in, the, in the forthcoming working paper, uh, which I will, I will I'll, I'll show you the title at the end, is that the problem is there is that when, when liberals had a meeting with Larkovsky, uh, German Greve had a meeting with him and said, you know, we're not happy with transfer pricing. We're not happy that you know the, the oil lobby is controlling the parliament because the, the parliament at the time, the particular the, the, the committee on taxation was controlled by Yukos. It had, you know, uh, Mr. Dubov, uh, one of the Yukos managers, um, was the head of that committee. So all uh, what Putin wanted when he came to power, he said, I want a simple taxation system, simple to administer. I want a simple system to administer the oil industry. Um, and uh, I want, uh, you know, and a number of, a number of uh, uh, basically, uh, the, the liberal, liberal economists who came with him uh, uh, to Moscow, uh, came up with with, with uh, a number of a whole package of, of reforms to make the system uh, more uh, simple to administer. But the problem is that um, all that legislation which they were supposed to pass was either derailed in the parliament because the parliament was, like I said, controlled by by the oil lobby, or it was changed to, in, to such a way that that uh, those laws were not really uh, doing 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 any 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 sort of uh, uh, creating really more. Um, the system that Putin wanted. So when when, uh, when liberals had a had meeting with Khodorkovsky uh, and tried to persuade him to stop transfer pricing, to to stop sort of blocking the, um, uh, the the sort of the effort to create a more transparent taxation system, uh, they realized that that it's not working, and that's when the Silvikis stepped in and said, "Well, they can't sort this out. We'll sort this out for you." And this basically exactly what happened with the Yukos affair, that um, um, 
the, 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 the force was used, uh, Kirsch was used to pass it, uh, to change the change. So, it's a, so there were many, many ways, uh, many things were, were, were achieved as a result of the demise of Hukas. Of course, Rosneft uh, at the time, again, uh, because, uh, the, again, the, the conservative argument pushed the idea that we need, we need an NOC, we need, a, we need to boost Rosneft's role in, in the industry, and the, the only way we can do this is by, by um, uh, uh, getting it, giving it more assets, and then, then there was a talk about joining Gazprom with Rosneft, and then buying Sibneft, uh, and then uh, when the Yukos affair obviously, obviously happened, um, Yugansk Neftigaz, which is the key, uh, as you can see, the key asset now of Rosneft, uh, and was the key asset of, of Yukos, uh, was taken over, and at the time, um, it was decided that Gazprom should really deal with gas issues in Russia, and Rosneft should deal with oil issues in Russia, and uh, Sibnev was not really uh, as interesting in terms of its, its, uh, its uh, uh, capacity and in terms of uh, what it can generate in terms of both oil, oil, oil volumes and, and also in terms of uh, the, the, the cash flows and so on and so forth. So um, Rosnev settled for, for Yugansk Neftegas and Sibnev was, uh, because Gazprom wanted a part of the sort of oil gain, uh, it was, it was uh, allowed by uh, Sibnev. Uh, now, of course, as you can see, Rosneft is, uh, Yugansk Neftgas is responsible for over 50% of, of Rosneft's uh, production. So, uh, um, but, um, another important aspect which, which I would mention is that also in the, in the 2000s, in the early 2000s, um, the system of two keys was abandoned. Is when the regions had, uh, like I said, because regional elites were so powerful in the 90s, uh, Yeltsin gave a lot of powers uh, uh, to regional authorities in terms of management of the oil industry. And um, with the decline of, uh, of the, the sort of the influence of oligarchs, uh, the, uh, which in a way actually played a certain, a very important role in, in reintegrating, reintegrating the, the oil industry and reintegrating Russia politically, um, I can talk about this, but uh, a big chunk of, 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 of my book actually deals with that, with, with the relationship between federal and regional elites and how, uh, how um, big Russian large oil companies help the federal government to bring those regions back to the federal orbit and reintegrate Russia, uh, both economically and politically. Uh, so the, the key system was also abandoned. The Turkey system of oil taxation, uh, oh, sorry, oil licensing, uh, uh, which uh, the main idea of that system was that uh, if a company wants to operate in a certain field, it would it would uh, have to get a license, which was jointly approved by the federal government and also a relevant relevant regional authority. So that system was changed. Uh, but the, the the problem the problem of of, of uh, uh, I think. Towards, towards the mid 2000s, there was uh, also realization that, uh, um, with the decline of, of uh, the resource base and the decline of the sort of Soviet legacy assets in Russia, um, there need to be new ways how to develop uh, new resources. And um, at the moment, uh, the way the way the way it looks is that the government. Um, wanted to go for new projects for green fields in East Siberia, wanted to develop uh, the Arctic, uh, you know, uh, oil and gas. It's, but by the way, it's mainly, it's mainly gas, it's about 70 to 25%, about 70 to 30% ratio, it's, it's mostly gas. But the problem with, with, the problem with uh, East Siberian development and the Arctic development is that East Siberia, despite all the excitement, um, it will not yield the same, the same volumes of, of oil. Uh, as, for example, uh, the traditional field, uh, traditional uh, hydrocarbon uh, resource bases, uh, um, uh, geological provinces, uh, particularly in West Siberia. And some of the large projects uh, uh, which uh, the government uh, defines as East Siberian projects, uh, they actually, uh, geologically, they're linked to, to West Siberian projects uh, because most of East Siberian projects are uh, geologically very different, uh, small, very small uh, clusters uh, of, of hydrocarbons, 
which are quite difficult to develop. You need, you need to build new, infra new infrastructure um, in very harsh climates. Uh, with with uh, the Arctic development, I asked one of ExxonMobil's uh, geogeologists uh, uh, in London uh, in the, when there was a meeting in the Geological Society about how long do you think it's going to take to develop Arctic hydrocarbons. He said, well, up to 40 years commercially. Uh, and that's, you know, so all this excitement in the, in the press, uh, you know, make, make people, uh, gives, I think, gives the wrong impression about that uh, some Arctic development, there will be oil coming from the Arctic in the next couple of years. Uh, nothing is going to happen for at least a decade, uh, and uh, if, if not longer. So, um, so the challenge is, is that the, the, basically the, pro the problem with private, Russian private oil companies, they were giving a chance to uh, manage the industry, they were giving a chance to invest, uh, provide adequate investments. But because of political risks and because of high concentration of ownership, because if you look at uh, uh, the ownership structure of, uh, of uh, even, in, even 10K BP, uh, you know, in BP you have the largest shareholder within, you know, it's a, it's a private, uh, well, former, former national champion of, of, you know, British national champion, but now it's a private, uh, private corporate entity. So I think it's about 5% is controlled by, um, by uh, I think, BlackRock uh, uh, Fund, uh, which is an American uh, investment fund. Um, and whereas when it comes to, to Russian, Russian ownership, you will see that uh, Alpha is 70% uh, of it is controlled by three people. Uh, uh, you know, Renova is 70% by one person. Uh, Access Industries is 70% controlled by one person. So because of highly high, high concentration of, of, of ownership, um, there is an argument in literature uh, and uh, one of the, for example, one of the, one of the uh, academics who taught here, Valery Krukov, together with Arlok Moy, they, they argued in one of the, uh, I think it was, uh, I forgot the name of the journal, but um, um, they, they argued that because of high concentration of ownership uh, and because of the political risks, uh, private, private uh, individuals uh, tend not to invest uh, not to you know, sort of invest in the production of, of uh, more oil. Uh, they just want to maintain, uh, maintain uh, uh, high levels of, of uh, uh, dividends. Uh, however, uh, TNKBP is, not, is, not, uh, is, is different in that respect uh, because they also invested uh, substantial amounts and also, but they also paid the highest, the highest uh, dividends. I'll show you, uh, uh, you know, the the sort of the, the how much, how much uh, the, in terms of, in terms of, this is, by the way, this is a slide. I didn't put it at the end, but the source is this Troika, Troika Dialogue report, uh, which is now owned by, by Sberbank, as you know. Um, the, so the, so what happened is that if you read the Russian news on a regular basis, you'll see that there are fuel shortages. There is some kind of cartel arrangements uh, between uh, Russian private companies when it comes to uh, petroleum markets. By the way, uh, Russian, uh, most Russian companies operate as regional monopolies, uh, so, which means that they, they dominate, often dominate the, the regional petroleum markets and set prices. And uh, so the, 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 one of the problems with, uh, with the oil industry, with the, with the uh, refining industry in Russia is that the lack of investments in, in the refining um, capacity and modernization of refineries. And uh, so one of the arguments, again, of this uh, sort of pro-state uh, people in the government is that we need, we need a, a state-controlled, large state-controlled company which will both uh, be sort of the, the vanguard uh, of East Siberian development, Arctic development, uh, development of, of uh, uh, upgrading the refineries, uh, modernizing the, the uh, you know the, the 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 refining industry and also um, making sure that there is no shortage of petroleum products. There have been some changes. I mean, there, were, there was obviously uh, some tax tax changes uh, of the tax regimes, uh, as you know that the. the six, uh, the 6660 uh, tax regime, which will basically the idea was to uh, uh, to promote uh, 
And so the idea was to promote the, uh, 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 the development and the pr production of, of uh, high-end uh, petroleum products instead of uh, heavy mazut type uh, products, uh, you know, of, uh, bunker, bunker fuel type uh, products. So, um, and also, um, the, I think one of the dilemmas for the government is that because of the decline of, of, uh, of the resource base, there will be decline of fiscal revenues, as you can see on this slide. By the way, this slide is, uh, is, um, is a translation from, from uh, Russian into English of the Russian Energy Ministry's uh, presentation, um, uh, which was given, uh, uh, I think it was in, in the summer of this year, in, I think, July or June this year. So and the, 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 the problem is that the, you basically have all output decline, you have declining fiscal revenues, you have a uh, uh, commercially unviable resource base, which is not interesting to Russian companies to develop those brownfields uh, simply because they're just technically challenging, they're too expensive to develop. And, uh, uh, and uh, the, the, now the idea is to promote uh, a, better, a better tax regime, but the problem is that it is, it is still questionable whether the government can afford a new tax regime. But at the same time, uh, Again, during the Valda meeting, when we had the meeting with the liberal, uh, the sort of the, the liberal economic uh, branch of the government, uh, all the ministers, uh, they all know that uh, there will be decline of resource base. They all accept it, and also that, that there will be declining decline also in revenues from the oil sector. By the way, the oil sector, the oil and gas sector, contribute about 52 percent of of uh, uh, fiscal revenues to the Russian budget. Out of those 52 percent. Uh, about three to five percent comes from the gas sector, um, and one idea is to move the tax burden. One of the arguments in, of government experts is move the tax burden from the oil industry to the gas sector. But again, that doesn't look that it's actually it's actually happening at, at this stage. So there are lots of problems, and another problem is that uh, there was there was an interesting study of Arct on Arctic development ma ma uh, made by a Skolkovo Energy Center, uh, saying that. Uh, the, the companies that will benefit from Arctic uh, development and from the, from the tax regime, special tax regime for the Arctic, will be um, uh, uh, Rosneft and IOCs. And if Rosneft is in private hands, it means that uh, the government will actually receive even less from, from, from the development of the Arctic. And in a way, in a way it's actually better to, to keep Rosneft in, in uh, in, uh, in the hands of the government, because then the government can can somehow squeeze more dividends from from Rosneft. And um, another problem, uh, which which basically happened with with Luke oil, I'll show you, you know, because in terms of liquids, I mean Luke oil still in terms of oil production, Luke oil is the second largest uh, oil producer. But in terms of liquid production, it's um, you know, it's 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 gone from from this, the the second position now to to the first to, to sort of to the third position last year, simply because uh, there was a, uh, a geological mistake with one of the fields, and uh, instead of uh, you know they uh, they they spent uh, I don't remember exactly now I think over one billion dollars on 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 uh, uh, bringing that 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 field to commercial production, but because of geological mistake. Uh, and also some other, I think the mistake in technical approaches, uh, there was um, a problem with that particular field. And as a result, Luke Oil now is, is, is losing, it's losing its, its uh, sorry, I'm, I have to go through this, uh, it's losing its, 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 in terms of its output. Um, uh, and this is, this is one, of the, one of the problems of, of not only just of Luke Oil, it potentially could, could be, uh, uh, this sort of jackpot approach, we call it, uh, uh, of, of oil companies. I mean, if you, if you look at this at this slide, you'll see that uh, most of these uh, private companies rely on one field or two two projects, um, hoping that this will somehow this project will somehow boost boost their, their output. And and this is um, uh, this is uh, basically the, the, the projected uh, production. Of, of uh, in, in the Russian oil industry, um, you know, by 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 private company. But one interesting thing, if you look at the period uh, starting from from uh, you know 2020, 2014, 
and you know, going up to 2020, you see that most of this, most of this new fields as well, uh, as well uh, are being developed, will be developed by TNKBP or Rosneft, which is also uh, one, of, one of the reasons why, why uh, uh, it makes sense to take control over, uh, over TNKBP. Uh, because by taking control over TNKBP, Rosneft solves several problems. It, 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 it gets access to new fields, uh, it gets access to, uh, to technology which BP supplied because BP helped uh, uh, TNK uh, uh, to boost its production by about 30 percent. Uh, the sort of this uh, sort of new brownfield revolution, as some some experts called it, uh, um, and uh, also uh, access to gas because Rosneft is now moving more towards the gas sector and could could potentially I, I, I see in the next few years potentially. Uh, some sort of battles taking place between uh, between Gazprom and Rosneft uh, over uh, how we manage uh, the gas, uh, both domestic gas markets, but also foreign gas markets. Because when it comes to uh, uh, European markets, you know that they, uh, uh, with the shale gas revolution, resulted uh, in, in America resulted in uh, in a considerable increase of. Uh, new sources of, of, of gas, uh, because all the, all the gas, liquefied natural gas, which was supposed to go to the United States, is now going, uh, well, going elsewhere, particularly Qatar LNG. Uh, and um, uh, that, that had two, two, two issues. The one issue is, is uh, it created some kind of pressure on oil-linked gas prices, uh, which Gazprom is using uh, in, its, in, in, its, in its deals with European uh, consumers, but also in terms of the um, long-term contracts. And one of the arguments of, of uh, the so-called independent uh, gas producers in Russia, such as Novatek, but also Rosneft, is that uh, Russia should choose uh, volume, volumes over, over prices when it comes to European, European gas markets. So we need to supply more gas. Uh, we need to, for us, it's probably a good idea to supply cheap gas. Because if we if we supply if we supply cheap gas to European markets, then we can we will undermine LNG supplies to Europe. We will undermine renewables. We will undermine any any sort of talk about shale gas development. We will also boot, boost boost uh, uh, European economic recovery, and we will also boost uh, uh, future demand of gas. And also not only retain our role in the gas sector, but also increase our role in the gas sector. So this is this is so I, I see potentially. Uh, Rosneft emerging as uh, uh, Rosneft emerging as um, as sort of a serious uh, a serious force in the gas sector as well in Russia, both in Russia and also abroad, uh, and also uh, because now Rosneft has serious partnerships with with companies such as Exxon, ENI, uh, Statoil, and uh, BP. It could it could use different strengths of those companies. In order to uh, in order to uh, uh, boost its role in, in international markets, as you know, that uh, uh, Rosneft uh, is buying some interesting assets that uh, uh, TNKBP has in Latin America and and, and uh, uh, in other regions, uh, and um, but also it could rely on on uh, the strengths of some companies in terms of their trading arms in Europe, both in terms of uh, oil sales. Uh, and also uh, gas and, and you know petroleum uh, petroleum products as well. So um, uh, this is um, something which is uh, again this you can see on this this is this is from Rosneft's uh, presentation uh, just just very recently showing that uh, particularly that 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 uh, key there that that uh, table in in the top uh, corner is interesting it shows the combined uh, reserve base you know the the uh, oil production you know over 4 million barrels uh, uh, gas production so it's a, it's a, in a way it's a very smart move uh, i think on part of 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 uh, you know, Igor Sechin in particular uh, and also uh, the fact that uh, I think for the first time, this is something which we are writing in our, in our, in our papers, that for the first time, in, I think in Russian history, uh, the so-called uh, 
uh, conservatives or siloviki provide a new channel of access uh, for the Kremlin to Western corporate world. Because before, before the uh, before this this uh, this basically the reemergence of Rosneft, the people who really provide a channel between the Kremlin and the West or Western financial institutions were uh, Russian liberal economists because they are the ones who negotiate with IMF, they are the ones who had access to the Western banking, banking community. Whereas now, uh, with, uh, with the emergence of, of, of Rosneft, Rosneft has actually become a new channel. Uh, and from, from, a political, from a political point of view, um, I think Siloviki now have, uh, can also provide an, uh, an important institutional base for the Kremlin. Um, uh, which, for example, liberal economists provided in the 90s to Boris Yeltsin, liberal economists together with, with, uh, with the oligarchs. Uh, and now, uh, now uh, we, have, we have a completely new configuration where uh, the President Putin or whoever is, is, is going to succeed him, uh, I have serious doubts that he's going to stay, stay in power uh, for two terms, maybe even questionable, maybe for one term. But the, the, the Kremlin can rely now both on, on both domestically and internationally on, on so-called liberal camp and the conservative camp because those two camps they both have very serious exposure to Western, the Western corporate and financial institutions. Um, when it comes to, uh, yeah, basically this is, this is the, the, the our, forthcoming, uh, our forthcoming paper. Uh, that's, that's, the, uh, that's its title. And, uh, uh, and of course, in this talk, I cannot cover everything. And, uh, but uh, one, one interesting aspect, of course, uh, something which about Russian equity market, because privatization didn't really make sense uh, to privatize uh, the, the, you know, the, I mean, proper privatization, not, 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 not selling a stake to, to a Western IOC, because that's not really sort of uh, uh, like, you know, like some kind of auction or, or so on and so forth. It's really, it's really uh, uh, an exchange uh, uh, of, 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 of assets. Um, so, because equity market is, you know, was, is, is depressed and Russian, Russian oil companies are undervalued, I think this is one of, our, one of the arguments that uh, Igor Sechin used against uh, uh, Medvedev Dvorkovich sort of uh, uh, agenda, saying that, you know, what's the point of us uh, privatizing now, and then Putin came up with an idea that actually, well, Rosneftygas can take part in, in, in privatization. Rosneftygas is, is a holding company which controls uh, uh, 74 point uh, something percent uh, in, in, uh, in Rosneft, but now it will sell stake, part, part of its uh, stake in Rosneft to, uh, 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 to, to BP. So the, uh, <clears throat> so the, the basically everything was against privatizing Rosneft, both in terms of the challenges that the Russian oil industry is facing in, in, uh, the, with the development of new fields uh, in East Siberia and the Arctic, both in terms of uh, the fiscal issues, uh, both in terms of the failures of, of, of private companies to really uh, manage the industry uh, properly uh, and, and also to really boost production. But, um, and uh, something I would like to, to say about, uh, about um, uh, small and medium companies now is, um, if you look at the United States, of course the legal regimes, uh, the, way, the way that uh, the, the licensing procedure, the, the, of course the political regime is very different to Russia. Uh, but in the United States, uh, small and medium companies have been responsible for uh, over 45% of oil output in Russia, it's between three to four percent. In the 90s, uh, Russian small and medium companies were responsible for about up to 12 percent of national oil output. Um, but again, there were political reasons for the decline of political and economic reasons for the decline of the role of small and medium companies in Russia, because in the majority of cases in the 90s, small and medium companies were all, were created by uh, regional elites, which used them as an institutional of financial institutional base of their rule in the regions. And also, um, uh, often sometimes criminal, criminal uh, groups uh, created some of the small companies. 
um, in the 90s. So what happened in, in, in the 2000s and late 90s is that the, the, the growth in the industry in many ways was achieved also uh, when Russian vertical industry oil companies started buying these smaller companies because for them it was the easiest way to, instead of investing in, 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 in new fields or, or you know, applying sort of new technological approaches to oil production, it was easy for them just to buy, to buy a small company with a very interesting license. Uh, so this was one thing. And second, second thing is that uh, uh, indirectly the Kremlin promoted uh, this process of uh, big oil companies taking over the small companies because it wanted to displace, remove, uh, completely sort of uh, destroyed the financial base of Russian regional elites, uh, their traditional financial bases. So new bases which were built in Russia now are based main, mainly on the sort of vertical vertical power. Uh, so um, <clears throat> so that, that's, that's, that's basically the main reason for, for the decline uh, of the role of uh, small and medium companies. However, uh, this could change if the government uh, decides to uh, introduce uh, uh, specific measures uh, when it comes to uh, the development of, of uh, uh, Russian oil output. Because at the end of the day, some of the small fields, some of the brown fields, some of the sort of uh, uh, idle wells, which uh, uh, Ru Russian vertical state oil companies are not interested in developing because they don't make commercial sense for them at all. But for small and medium companies, um, because the infrastructure is there, uh, which is in, in most cases uh, is, 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 was built in Soviet times, but obviously is owned by, controlled by, by, um, by these vertically integrated oil companies. So there is one problem, it's the problem of access to that infrastructure, and there are also problems of, of um, uh, um, tax incentives, giving tax incentives to small, small and medium companies in terms of uh, uh, making it commercially viable for them to, to start producing. Uh, particularly, uh, when, I, when I interviewed uh, a number of uh, uh, representatives for small and medium companies, asking them how, how, how much can you, you know, how quickly that will it take for you if, there is, if the tax incentives are right, how long will it take for you to, pre to boost production? They said, well, we can, we can boost production by one million barrels Within, within three to five years. And that's a lot because, you know, it's 10% it's of Russian oil output. Um, and if you look at the United States, you know, the, 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 the force behind the shale gas revolution, the shale oil development in the States, it was small and medium companies. So, um, and this is one of the dilemmas of the government. And the way, the way it looks at the moment is that uh, they actually planning to introduce certain measures next year. There was a special law on, uh, which was prepared by the government of Hunty Mansi Autonomous Okrug uh, to develop, uh, you know, boost uh, the role of small and medium companies in, the, in that region because, uh, again, because of the declining production, uh, the governments of resource-rich regions are concerned about what to do with, uh, with sort of social stability. Uh, if, you, if, if companies start closing their wells, uh, start closing some of their enterprises, uh, um, and the, 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 this, the only solution to that, uh, according to the, the Hunty Mansi uh, government, is, is uh, the pr you know, creation of uh, a number of small and medium companies that can boost uh, output from brownfields, that can apply technical approaches uh, to, the, to, you know, to Russian uh, oil production. Um, but again, this is interesting, interesting, um, uh, interesting story uh, because if you look, for example, at Tatarstan. Uh, this, uh, because Tatarstan had uh, great powers, managed to secure great powers in the 90s uh, when it comes to domestic economic uh, uh, development. They themselves uh, are doing really well. The oil companies, the small and medium companies, are responsible for over 20% of, of the regional oil output. And, uh, of course, if in Russia, uh, small and medium companies uh, will be responsible for 20% of national output, that would be great. And, um, and this is the argument, for example, of, of, of experts, uh, uh, of many Russian experts, uh, and, uh, and also a, a number now of international experts, is that the government really needs to, needs to focus on, yeah, partnership with ICC is good, but that's, for, that's, that's mainly for 
challenging development uh, uh, you know, of new ge geological fields, uh, such as Bajenova formation, uh, you know, which is, which is, which is uh, will be developed by, by partnership between Gazprom and BP and, and uh, Rosneft partnership with Statoil and, and uh, with, uh, with Exxon. Um, um, and also, you know, the, the development of the Arctic and this Siberian basically, yes, yeah, it's, it's great to do it uh, uh, on the basis of partnership, a partnership between uh, Russian national company Rosneft and IOCs, but <clears throat> with some participation of private companies. But at the end of the day, the, the, true, the true solution to, uh, to Russian declining oil output is um, the development of small and medium companies. But again, this goes to the ideological debate which has always been taking place in the Russian government between sort of, uh, the, the, the sort of liberal economists and the more conservative pro-government pro uh, officials is, is Russian oil industry, is it a hindrance to Russian modernization, economic modernization, or can be a vehicle for Russia's economic modernization? I personally think that uh, it, could, it could potentially become a vehicle under certain circumstances, because all this talk about uh, uh, developing of uh, innovative technologies uh, uh, at Skolkovo and, and uh, uh, sort of diversifying the economy, uh, you know, the government officials have been talking about this for the past 20 years. They have not diversified the economy. Uh, new technologies uh, is just, uh, is, 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 is uh, uh, how can I put it diplomatically? Uh, um, well, it's not, it's not really there. Uh, so it's all, it's all just big talk. So, but at the same time, if, if, if the oil industry with, with the technology transfer, with the spillover effect, uh, can, can play a very important role in, in, in uh, the, sort of the development and modernization of Russian economy. And another issue here is which role Russia, does Russia want to play in the global economy? Does it want to be service economy or uh, as, as sort of... Uh, uh, some Russian politicians call it the, the sort of the uh, uh, what is this appendage, the predataka, the, the resource appendage to to uh, China or to to Europe. Uh, but the Kazakhs created a very good term for it. They call it, well, we service economy to big powers. You know, and I think it's not it's, it's it's a much better term diplomatically. So whether Russia wants to be a service economy to Europe or to to Asia Pacific. Um, or whether it wants to, to compete uh, with a sort of te uh, technologically with a, when it comes to the development of innovative technologies with Silicon Valley, with the United States, with India, you know, with China now. I think that uh, the, the political institutions uh, in Russia and the potential political instability are not very conducive to the development of, of uh, sort of uh, a huge innovative cluster, but also the, in terms of corruption, the you know, high levels of corruption as well are not very uh, basically main hindrance uh, when it comes to the development of of of, of new technologies. Uh, and uh, so I will end here. This is this is our forthcoming paper. Of course, um, I only I only touched upon some of the issues. I could not really cover everything because we cover everything. We cover. Um, the financial markets, we cover the, the, the issue of geological base, we cover the, the fiscal issues, we cover political issues. And uh, in, in a way, this, this, this study is, 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 um, is sort of a prequel uh, to the book, which is, to my book, which is coming out uh, next year, uh, called The Battle for Russian Oil. And it looks exactly at the, the main forces which were involved in the management of the, of the oil industry in Russia uh, from, from the sort of late 80s, early 90s, up to the present day. I just need to now update the final chapter uh, and incorporate all the latest sort of changes and try to provide some kind of, some kind of forecast. Thank you very much. Thank you, Shimon. Yeah, well, please ask questions. Well, let me ask the first question then. Uh, just your opinion. So, do you understand correctly that the putting the cost behind the barrels that made sense because it's tax with the development of the tax? No, I think it, it had to do it had to do with with with, uh, with uh, uh, this was one of the reasons, but the the way we we wait we're, we're trying to explain this is that uh, when you are trying to create 
uh, uh, a system which is manage manageable, a fiscal system which is manageable. But also, of course, there were political reasons. Uh, there, were, there was, uh, I think, Richard Sack wrote a book, uh, which unfortunately, which unfortunately was withdrawn from 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 all the bookshops because uh, uh, it was. Uh, uh, there was a, uh, it was threatened. He was threatened with a lawsuit, uh, and uh, he covers. Uh, he covers. Uh, he's got about 40 reasons, I think, for the demise of Khodorkovsky. And uh, and just the number is is I think says a lot. I think it's. it's I, I would call it the alignment of unlucky stars. When it comes to when it comes to the Khodorkovsky demise, uh, this was just one of the reasons. I mean, of course. Uh, the, the one reason is that because he became so politically powerful, and uh, uh, again, this is this is I mean I mean I mean I may not uh, say it accurately, but uh, when he had a meeting with Greff, it was reported in the press. He basically said, "Well, I control the parliament. I can do whatever I want. Who are you?" You know. Um, so this is a kind of um, he became too ambitious. Uh, I think politically. He may, may he may uh, wanted something better uh, for the country, but I think uh, uh, at the same time I think that the fact that the uh, Ukos was going to be uh, in in the hands of, of of a foreign company, I think this is one of the, which was a serious threat that the government will lose sort of its role in the oil industry, and the oil industry will basically be be controlled by by. Uh, by Western Western powers, and this would, would not really go well politically uh, in Russia in the long run. Um, and of course, Khodorkovsky was made a case of uh, he, he you know they needed an example to show to other uh, politically active oligarchs. Because I mean, if you look at if you look at uh, all the Russian politically active oligarchs, they're either behind bars or they they're in London, you know, or somewhere else. You know, Berezovsky, look what happened to Berezovsky, to, to what happened to Gusinsky. Uh, and I think it was, uh, but the interesting thing is that uh, Khodorkovsky was also against production sharing agreements, which was the basis of IUC involvement in Russia in the 90s. He was the one who advanced the idea that if, uh, if, Russian, if, so if, if, so if international oil companies want to get involved in Russian oil production, forget about PSAs. If you want, you, if you want part of the game, buy a stake in our company. Uh, and this is exactly what, what uh, which is being done now with Rosneft as well. It's the same, the same kind of, the same kind of arrangement. Because I think what what Sechin did is, is uh, uh, I think he's a very, very, very intelligent man because he he took ideas from some ideas from Shafranik from the 90s. He took ideas some ideas from Khodorkovsky. He took some ideas from from uh, from national oil companies, uh, you know, in, in Norway, in, in other countries, and uh, and also. Uh, Looked at the weaknesses of, of uh, some of some of uh, IUCs, for example, such as BP, uh, because BP was obviously in quite a weakened position after the Gulf of Mexico disaster. But also um, this constant stalemate uh, when it comes to uh, to the relationship with the AI consortium. Uh, I wrote a, I wrote a piece about this called "BP Russian Billionaires in the Kremlin: A Power Triangle That Never Was," which were published in November last year. Which looks at this at a number of these issues, uh, you know, in greater detail. Uh, but of course, uh, when 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 Putin was asked at the Valdai meeting about uh, uh, the reason for Rosneft, the way he presented it, in some ways, is accurate because BP came to Russian government and said, uh, "This relationship with AI is not working. We really want we really want to get you know uh, have a working relationship with Rosneft." And uh, so the idea was uh, to uh, uh, I think Putin realized that he will satisfy all the people, both in the government, uh, but also when it comes to to BP. Uh, you know, in the government, he would his argument was that okay, BP is now getting stake in 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 Rosneft, its privatization. At the same time, Rosneft re retains its role; it's going global now. So I'm satisfying also the the pro-state, the conservative agenda. So he but just with this one move, uh, he satisfied both camps. Uh, you know, uh, within his within, within his sort of inner circle, and um, but uh, Khodorkovsky is obviously it's 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 it's, it's a story of, of sort of uh, um, political resistance. It's a story of, of who is actually in charge of of of, the, of, of Russia, uh, and uh, I think that uh, um, the fact that as well that that uh, there was this sort of 
rumor that Fedorkovsky wanted Russia to create parliamentary, turn it into parliamentary democracy. And uh, they needed to strike quite quickly because, with the Khodorkovsky affair as well, because uh, this was just before the Russian uh, parliamentary elections. And one of the arguments which was used by Siloviki when they said to Putin, they said, you know, if we delay, if we, if we, if we, wait, any, if we wait longer, then, then the UCAS will, will take control over the parliament again and we will not be able to, you know, to do anything. And so, so the, like I said, it was, it was an alignment of unlucky stars for, for UCAS. Um, and UCAS was one of the companies which also wanted to build uh, private, uh, private uh, pipelines within Russia. So, you know, it's, it's a question, of course, it's a question of uh, 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 one, I, I would put it this way. When it comes to Russian oil industry, um, when Westerners look at Russian oil industry, or just overall the way Russian economy operates, if you look at private companies and you look at state-owned companies, often private companies are operating in the interest of the state, and state-controlled companies are often operated in the interests of private individuals. So, uh, so it's quite, it's quite, uh, so it's quite difficult to, to, uh, to, to, you know, to to understand Russia in some ways. When people say, "Oh, you know, this is a private entity," actually, it's not because you get a phone call from from some guy in, in, in high positions of power and says, "I want money for 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 this project. You need to cough up money for this for another project." You need to support the hockey team. You need to, you know, we are planning to build a, a new, new Silicon Valley. You need to cough up some money, you know. So it's, 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 it's very different to, to the way Western, I think, Western uh, econ economic world operates. Uh, uh, and uh, like I said, when it comes to state control companies, um, you know, often they're the easiest way to, to uh, boost one's, uh, you know, or sort of facilitate one's personal interests, so. Okay. Thank you very much for your uh, very interesting and stimulating presentation. My question refers to the role of Russia's regions. Mm -hmm. uh, those are the regions that are dominated by Russia, by national, national republics. What role they play today in uh, oil business, other stuff, Chechnya, Yeah, well, the, the the big chunk of my book deals with this issue um, because there is um, uh, there is um, one chapter which is entitled "Power Comes with the Territory." And it, it looks at how um, certain regions had more power, uh, both economically and politically, um, simply because they could use the so-called the nationalist trump card. Uh, something there will be, I think, uh, I had to be quite careful with this book, I think, because there will be a number of revelations when it comes to how the, the, the oil, different oil sort of groups promoted their political interests. When it comes to Bashkortostan, for example, uh, when, the, when, the <laughs> when the new parliament was elected in the 90s, uh, the MPs received uh, video record players from the local oil directors because they made the right voting, they pushed the right button. And when it comes to a sort of proclamation of sovereign, state sovereignty of Bashkortostan. Uh, so, um, and also, when I interviewed uh, some of the leaders of nationalist movement, uh, they were financially boosted and they were used uh, when they organized these big rallies, nationalist rallies in, 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 in capitals, in Kazan and Ufa in particular. Uh, the idea was to scare Moscow um, uh, into giving more powers to those regions. And they succeeded quite well. Uh, I, have a, I, have a, I, even, I have a table why certain regions, uh, you know, which decisions they took and uh, what powers uh, uh, they actually got from the federal government. Uh, when it comes to Tatarstan and Bashkortostan, it's the only, it's the only two regions that have stake in Transneft. Uh, they have stake in one of the subsidi two subsidiaries of, of Transneft. Uh, they, are, they are the only two regions that had privatization on their own right. 
uh, they blocked, they, they stopped Yeltsin's uh, privatization decree of November 92, as you know. Uh, and they said, well, actually, this is, this is Russia, this is, we're independent now, we're sovereign states within Russia, yes. You know, but we, are, we have our own presidents, so you guys, you know, you, you just deal with other issues. And this is our, this, is, this belongs to the people of, of, of our region. But the thing is that they, they played quite well, the nationalist cut, because they both used the, the ethnic sort of issues, like the sort of oppression by the Russians of Bashkis and Tatars. But at the same time, they, they, um, because there is such a large uh, uh, community of other uh, groups, particularly Russians in those regions, they also promoted the idea of, uh, I remember in Bashkortostan, because uh, I come from that region, originally I come from Ufa, uh, the idea that the rallies was, uh, we, we'll turn Bashkortostan into second Kuwait. So they, <laughs> this was basically, of course people, and when, so when people came to referendum to vote for, for sovereign, so state sovereignty of, of those regions, they all, they all voted yes, because they said, you know, why should we give this to Moscow? You know, Moscow is getting all our money, and you know, at least we'll, we'll have a very happy life here and stuff like this. So, um, so in that respect, the elites quite skillfully used, uh, they, they mobilized masses for their, for their cause. But at the end of the day, the idea was to, to uh, take control over the, all those assets. Uh, so when it comes to Bashkortostan and Tatarstan, taxation, licensing, by the way, the two, two key system didn't work there because they said, this is our decision, we're making decisions to, when it comes to licensing ourselves. Then they started changing. Ta taxes they didn't pay for several years. They retained all the taxes in the regions. They didn't send anything to Moscow. Um, uh, so privatization, infrastructure, uh, even even uh, even uh, domestic petroleum market was controlled by Bashneft and, and Tatneft <coughs> in those uh, in those regions, but that started changing uh, uh, towards the end 90s because of the mm, I mean both regions are landlocked of course. But, uh, another reason is that because of the uh, the type of, of uh, oil that they have, as you know, you know it's high sulfur content, uh, heavy heavy oil, and uh, one of the reasons why, why uh, Bashkortostan and Tatarstan always fought for access, for securing access to the transient system is because this is basically the Euro's blend. You mix, you mix, you mix uh, high qualities uh, West Siberian oil, oil with uh, uh, oil from Bashkortostan and Tatarstan, which is heavy, uh, heavy oil with high sulfur content, and um, uh, you basically you benefit financially because if you try to sell that oil directly, it will be quite problematic, I think, to 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 sell that oil uh, in international markets. But this started changing uh, as well in terms of when the government or oil companies promoted the idea of oil quality bank. As you know, when they were talking about that the the companies that produce uh, poor quality oil will have to compensate to the guys who produce high quality oil. And again, Bashkortostan and Tatarstan were object, objecting that. But this was the breaking point for them. This is when they, when they uh, started giving up their powers because they realized that uh, if this oil quality bank was introduced, actually one of the, one of the, one of the uh, deputy speakers of Bashkortostan parliament said that, uh, and had an informal discussion uh, in the Russian presidential administration, they basically told them, guys, if you don't, if you don't give up your powers, if you don't start transferring taxes to the federal government, We'll introduce the oil quality bank. We'll make you bankrupt. You know, you'll go bankrupt within six months after the introduction of this oil quality bank. So they had, so they had no other, you know, reason, you know, no, no other choice but to give up their powers. But also, apart from that, in Bashkortostan, the federal government, because you know that in, in Tatarstan they retain control of Tatneft. In Bashkortostan, it was a different story because in, in Bashkortostan. Uh, again, there is a, a chapter of my book dealing with the elections of 2003 in Bashkortostan when uh, the, federal, the federal sort of elites promoted the, the participation of, of uh, uh, one of former managers of Lukoil, Ralif Safin, and uh, uh, one of the former owners of Meshprom Bank, uh, Sergei Verimenko, uh, to undermine Rahimov. And it's interesting because uh, they use they use everything, the, the, and Rahimov really lost uh, the elections. And then Rahimov had to go and back, uh, you know, went to the Kremlin and back. And I'm going, I'm going, to, I'm, I'll, I'm going to do whatever you want. And then as a result, uh, uh, 
URLC, Bash Credit Bank, was sold to uh, Luke Oil Control Company, Nick Oil, which is now is no longer it's no longer uh, uh, regional bank, as you know, URLC. You'll see it everywhere now. And uh, whereas uh, Bash Neft was sold to Alpha, uh, sorry, uh, to uh, AFK Systema, uh, you know, Yevtushenko's uh, company. So that changed, but Tatarstan, of course, is, is still playing a very important role. Um, um, I think, they, in, in some ways, um, Tatarstan was left to its own devices as long as they are, um, in, in some ways, they retain a lot of powers, but at the same time, I think, uh, because the elites there are quite um, proactive and modern thinking, unlike some other regions, uh, particularly around the red, sort of red belt in Russia, very conservative. Uh, I think that even if you compare the way the Bashkortostan and Tatarstan attracted investments, in 10 years' uh, time, uh, Bashkortostan attracted the same amount of investments as Tatarstan did in just one year. It's just the way that the way that institutions, the institutional design, and the way the elites uh, sort of view uh, how they should develop a region really matters. Now, if we're talking about the, the contemporary period, um, I think that Bashkortostan, of course, I mean, it's, it's really the, the story that is finished because Bashneft is, is, uh, is now a private uh, company owned by, uh, by, like I said, AFK Systema. Potentially, it will be an interesting company when they merge with uh, Rusneft, Gutsirev's company. Because Rusneft, Gutsirev's company is based on, um, he basically brought together some small and medium companies with interesting assets and created, uh, and created um, uh, this uh, Rusneft. Actually, this is some, uh, some uh, potentially would be an interesting structure for some of uh, vertically integrated oil companies in Russia if they use this kind of uh, small and medium companies under their control. Some of them are already doing it. Uh, uh, there is a number of sort of joint ventures with the participation of, of, uh, of uh, even companies such as Rosneft, you know, Gazpromneft, and, and so on and so forth, uh, which are operating a sort of small and medium segment. Um, so I, 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 I personally see the future, and, uh, and also the, the one of one of Russian ministers said that uh, they are planning to introduce uh, uh, next year special measures to develop small and medium companies in Russia. And like I said before, there was a law prepared by Hunter Mansi government uh, a few years ago, and there was even a big conference, uh, as, uh, as you remember. On, on that subject. Unfortunately, uh, even U local United Russia said, you know, well, promote this, but then I think then uh, either for, for, for political reasons or just uh, because there were some other priorities, uh, they, it, was, it was shelved. But um, let's see whether next year the government will introduce those measures. But the problem again with small and medium companies, something I didn't mention, is theft. Uh, theft of, of, uh, of oil from the Transnef system. Uh, this particularly been prominent. There are two regions in Russia that have this problem. It's uh, Dagestan and Samara region. And Samara region. It happens in other regions, but uh, but these are the, this was the sort of the uh, the sort of the uh, how can I put it the the ones who came at the top of the list. And Transneft even, they wrote a letter to the president of Dagestan asking him to deal with this uh, issue because uh, uh, the, the, the thieves uh, started using very sophisticated technology, actually investing millions of dollars into building this. One pipeline was running about 60 kilometers from, from the main Transneft pipeline and was hidden in a way that you, it was not possible to identify it. They even, ma they even managed to maintain pressure within a normal sort of level, within a transit system, so you would not be able to uh, identify that there was theft. So the thieves are becoming you know, sophisticated, and there was even um, the head of trans Transneft even said once, he said it's, it's a joke because uh, you know, the, uh, in some weddings in, in Dagestan, uh, the new couple get, gets presents, and then and they're presented with this sort of, uh, with this sort of stolen, stolen oil sort of pipeline. Uh, you know, so this is uh, obviously, 
not acceptable. And then these companies, some of the small and medium companies, you basically, what you do is that you create a small and medium company, then you, you, you buy a license for some small well, you only get about two buckets a year from that well, but, but then you, know, uh, uh, you steal oil and then you sell it back to Transneft. And, uh, and, it, and it's been a serious problem, but they, they're, introducing, they're introducing a new system, Nefty Control, oil control, uh, next year, uh, which will deal with this, I think even later this year, which will, which will uh, um, uh, they're, they're, they're applying very sophisticated technical approaches, which will identify where this oil comes from, uh, and they will know from basically everything about that oil from the well up to this sort of the, 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 the trans, trans system. Yeah. <coughs> Thank you for the talk. I'd like to ask a question. Um, what do you think about the growth of oil of Russia and of course the Russian oil along these days to latest included deals with the British Petroleum and Exxon? Um, what do you think? Will this include, will increase the role of Russian international oil Well, when it comes to oil markets, no, uh, not really. In terms of gas markets, potentially yes. Um, like I said earlier, uh, the argument that uh, independent gas producers and, and Rosneft is now using is that we need to focus on uh, supplying more gas, and not really, not really, not really be concerned about maintaining high gas prices in Europe. Uh, and I think there will be more pressure on Gazprom to start delinking. Um, uh, is gas prices from oil prices because there is a usually a delay of about six to nine months between the, 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 the you know the the how oil price changes and the gas price of gas from changes. Uh, so in that respect, yes, but oil because simply um, our institute has just published a book uh, which was actually came out on the first of November yesterday, uh, edited by Jonathan Stern on. Um, whether the world is moving towards global gas market and global gas price, uh, because at the moment gas markets are not really united. You know, you have you have it's quite it's quite uh, uh, you know quite quite diverse. I even ha I may even have uh, here uh, a presentation which I gave uh, yeah, and uh, this is something uh, which may be interesting to, to you for have to have a look at. Uh, oops, sorry. Yeah, so the in terms of in terms of the in terms of the pri pri prices, of course, LNG. I mean, you'll see that the, the, even when it comes to LNG, the the, the, the diversity of 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 uh, you know of, of prices is staggering, uh, and of course the uh, you know the the, the uh, at the end of the day, I think it's it's, it's just. Um, uh, the argument, the, I think the main argument in that book, I have not seen it, uh, but I think the main argument is that um, that Gazprom will come under a lot of pressure in the future, not only, not only externally, but also domestically, um, when it comes to its, the price regimes and price formulas it uses. So, and because Rosneft is now moving into gas market uh, quite, quite, uh, even with this Siberian development, uh, it's now getting some very interesting, very interesting uh, projects uh, uh, from TNK BP. Uh, so it's, it's going to be a very serious force in, in, in the gas sector in, in the next few years. Uh, I'm not saying it's going to happen in the next couple of years, but um, it, you know, it may take longer. But, but uh, because now oil companies are moving into gas sector, uh, Gazprom is trying to move into the oil sector as well. Now they're promoting shale oil development in in, um, in Bajenova, Bajenova formation with shale. Uh, they want to focus on not, not shale gas, but shale oil. Uh, and um, I think that I see that there will be problems because uh, Gazprom does not have this, this, this type, the, 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 in terms of dynamics of relationship with international players, international companies, Gazprom cannot really compete with Rosneft. Rosneft has now Build ties with all the key players, uh, you know, on the international markets. It's got Exxon, you know, 
uh, it's got PP, it's got ANI, it's got Statoil. So they all have their own strengths when it comes to technology, when it comes to development of uh, uh, offshore, Arctic offshore projects, particularly, you know, uh, uh, actually all of them do. Uh, but particularly, particularly Statoil and Exxon uh, have very, very strong, uh, uh, you know, uh, experience in that respect. Uh, so they, um, but when it comes to trading, yes, it's interesting uh, because BP provides, provide, will provide uh, Rosneft with access to its trading arm. And then, in a way, I, I, in a way, I think one of the arguments in our paper is that um, uh, now uh, Sechin is becoming, he's competing now with Timchenko, with, with uh, Gunvo. And this is one of the reasons why Gunvo has lost some of its standards because Rosneft is now, with the help of BP, is going to replace and start, start becoming a very active oil trader. But oil markets, they're not driven by, by uh, you know, by Gazprom, they're not driven by Rosneft. They're driven by uh, Wall Street and, uh, and, uh, and uh, OPEC. You know, Russia at the end of the day, it doesn't matter who, who produces oil in Russia, Russia is a free rider, you know. It's just, it's just on a bang wagon on of, 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 um, of uh, the way the way oil oil uh, oil contracts are traded and the, the availability of uh, oil you know uh, on the market is, is really um, the, the the people who really can supply more oil or decrease oil supply are uh, OPEC not Russia so yeah Yes, yeah, this is, this is also, we, we cover also electricity sector because the electricity sector, the reform of the electricity sector has failed. I mean, everybody recognizes this. And uh, Session is quite successfully using it and saying, oh, these liberals, look at them, they failed. It's my turn now. Let me give, you know, I, it's, my, I, it's my toy. I'm going to play now with this toy. So he's, um, so this is exactly what's happening. And I think that, uh, one of the ideas for privatization of Rosneft by, by, by the liberal camp was to displace, because the thing about Russian elites is that their, their power bases are very are concentrated around corporate assets, okay? And this is an, another argument of, of, of the paper, is that uh, the fact that the, the sort of the liberals wanted to privatize Rosneft was to undermine Sachin's corporate institutional base, okay, and they failed. So, um, it's a, very, it's a very interesting dynamics. I think it will be, it will be quite fascinating, particularly the forthcoming battle between Gazprom and Rosneft in the next few years. And I think, uh, to me, it looks like Gazprom is going to lose that battle because it's got too many, too many um, uh, um, competitors now emerging. And here, where he is, is I think, in, in another interesting uh, uh, aspect is, is that there could be potentially partnerships between Sechin and Timchenko against uh, Gazprom, uh, uh, you know, in terms of pushing, changing, changing the way the way it does its business. They replaced both in both in Russia and, and so in, in the oil sector, uh, in the oil sector they are competitors. In the gas sector, uh, Rosneft and and and, uh, and uh, Tim, Tim, Timchenko uh, are, are potentially allies. So. Yeah. The problem is, I think one of the problems when, when, when you read some sometimes uh, media reports, even in, in leading uh, international newspapers, is that people look at some story and they, they present, they, they, they don't present it often accurately simply because when it comes to Russian, the, the, the politics of the Russian energy sector, not just oil, gas, you know, you, you need to look at everything, you know, different aspects, as you rightly put it. People are playing not one chess game, but seven chess games sometimes at the same time. And if you think, oh, this guy lost that game, actually, no, he's not lost that game. He lost that game, but he's going to win another one. So, you know, you have to look at, you have to have um, the big picture. And it's quite difficult often for people to see the big picture, to see what's actually happening, why certain moves are being made. Uh, and, um, you know, it's, it's, it's not an easy task because you need, to, you need to look at a lot of the factors, factions, 
institutional constraints, uh, economic constraints, legal constraints, you know. Thank you. Yes, there is one question there. So you are talking about. Sorry, you are sitting quite far away. So your your, your question, your first question is about uh, the petroleum products displacing displacing crude crude oil. Yeah. And the second question was what about? Gas to liquids. Yes. GTL. Yes. Okay. Uh, well, the first the first. Uh, um, I think that, um, as you know, the, the the idea of the government is, or at least of, of President Putin, is to uh, uh, basically dis yeah, display. In in a way, in a way, you're right. You know, the idea is to uh, uh, export high high end petroleum products. Uh, instead of uh, instead of uh, crude oil, but uh, and some of the, some of the tax incentives uh, which were introduced uh, over the past couple of years uh, were seeking to uh, boost that. But um, I think that it's still for, for oil companies it is still uh, easier just to export crude oil. And uh, again, this is this is something. This is again the argument of Rosneft is that Rosneft can change that uh, as, a, as a serious a new player, uh, not, not new player, but a, a sort of an enhanced, an enhanced player or player with enhanced powers um, in the Russian oil industry uh, to change that, uh, that those dynamics. When it comes to when it comes to uh, all these uh, fuels that you mentioned, um, the the, the, the the, some of the, some of the refineries in Europe and in China as well, uh, I think potentially could could have problems because uh, they relied on on this sort of uh, low quality refined products, uh, uh, particularly you know mazut. You 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 saw this. I know I know traders in Switzerland. They're all sort of selling M25, M100, the sort of all these different types of mazut. Uh, and there was a lot of demand bunker for bunker fuels, uh, in particular, and um, because it was easier, any any sort of bitumen plant in Russia uh, was able to uh, produce this uh, sort of uh, very low quality uh, products without without much investment because they they had all these sort of old old facilities, and then they would they would ship the the you know this these fuels. And I think the idea uh, that, uh, as you know, this sort of, sort of samovar as well, this sort of the kind of uh, uh, illegal, illegal sort of refining, small refining plants. So the idea is to create some kind of um, um, not only transparency within the Russian uh, uh, refining industry, but also to uh, uh, to uh, create incentives so that. Uh, the, the companies will, will be interested in modernizing uh, their refineries because most of the Russian refineries were built in the 40s and 70s. I mean, a lot of them has been upgraded, and Bashkortostan in particular, actually, they, they've done they've done a lot of work in upgrading their their, their refineries. Uh, but the, at the end of the day, uh, I think um, companies still. There is there is a fee, there is a feeling now those tax breaks which were introduced uh, were not really adequate, and the next measures need to be done in order to promote uh, uh, 
the development of the refining industry in Russia. Because companies are now asking for delay, you know, some of them, Surgut Neftigaz wrote letter to the, to the government saying, oh, can we actually delay this because, you know, we, we, we were running out of time, we don't have, we don't have, we don't have time, we don't have, uh, uh, we, we were focusing on other issues, uh, uh, we, we need to change our investment strategy and this kind of stuff. Uh, so, again, this is, uh, this is where Rosneft comes in. When it comes to, um, so I see the future, yes, for that, but it will, it's going to take um, a few years. GTL, uh, I know that Gazprom is now, uh, uh, how can I put it, in, 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 in boosting the, the, the department, the number of, they're recruiting more people to, uh, to deal with those issues. And uh, uh, there was even one, uh, one lady who wrote uh, to our institute saying that she wants to come and Write, write a working paper on GTL in Russia. Uh, so it's, it's, of course it's, it's very new. And uh, uh, in, 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 it's not new, it's not a new idea, but I think it's everybody's getting very excited about it now. Uh, but the question is whether the government will, uh, will uh, uh, create incentives and whether this is, this is, uh, or whether this is, this is a way for um, uh, for domestic producers in Russia to diversify in a way their exposure in terms of what they, what they actually supply to the market. Uh, and, uh, and this is a dilemma, exactly the same dilemma in, in other uh, gas producing countries, uh, 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 particularly countries which produce both, both uh, large quantities of oil and large quantities of gas, such as, for example, Kazakhstan, where they, they've been talking about uh, using gas as a feedstock for the petrochemical industry, for the chemical industry. Uh, and uh, again, at, at, the, at, the end, at the end of the day, it's the question of the added value. Uh, added value and diversification of, 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 your, of your markets. And, uh, and this is something which is related to the issue of, of uh, uh, the gas game, the global gas game, how it's going to change. Because in, uh, you know, in terms of the United States, uh, a lot of the decisions which they're going to take, or, or this is a lot of a lot of the stuff in the, in the gas sector in the world globally, not not just not just uh, in North America, depends on the decisions of the next American administration is whether to ship gas, ex start exporting gas, uh, or whether to use that gas as a cheap feedstock for uh, its chemical industry or use it as a competitive advantage for, for, for just not just chemical industry, but also other industries. I personally think it will be both that they will both export and also use it domestically to satisfy all the interested parties. But uh, <coughs> of course, people now in, uh, in Russia realize that uh, the, the gas game is, is moving very, very fast. And now we need to go into the added value products. We need to, we need to look at... Uh, um, how not only retain our role in, in the, in the tradi traditional, our traditional sort of uh, segment in the gas markets, but also how to create sort of new niche, or occupy new niche in both domestically and ex externally. So there is future, they're all looking at, at this. Uh, it's just a question of uh, how quickly can they do this? I personally think that uh, independent companies are probably better equipped because they're, they're much faster when it comes to moving. I mean, look at, look at the, the development of Stockman. You know, the, that's, that's one of the problems and arguments of, for example, uh, government liberals is that they're saying that state control companies are not as efficient as, as private companies. Private companies can act very quickly uh, when it comes to certain change in, in, uh, in the, in the glo global markets. Uh, whereas, uh, you know, for Gazprom it took uh, years and years to you know, have discussions about what we're going to do with Stockman and then Shell gas revolution happened. In a way, it's good that it happened that they didn't actually start <laughs> developing Stockman because now it would have been even worse, uh, the exposure. Uh, so, um, um, but the answer to your question is yes, uh, in short, and uh, I just tried to present uh, uh, the sort of discussions and debates which are happening now within the gas community and the oil community. And another problem, not problem, but another sort of uh, issue when it comes to the difficulty of understanding the sort of political drivers. Because the, the, a lot of the decisions to the gas sector, both in Russia and, like I said, in the United States, will be driven by domestic political considerations. 
And that's and that's something that that is something quite difficult to often to understand for for people because you have to look at different games, you know, being played at the same time. Sorry, I'm um, uh, We're actually um, we're running out. Okay. Yeah, thanks very much for listening to talk and answers to the questions. So, mm -hmm. Thank you. Well, thank you for good questions. You always say that uh, you can judge the audience by the quality of the questions. <laughs>